I, I, I have the Center for Poetry and Poetics. I'm just delighted and, and uh, along with our assistant director, Matt Martello, uh, to welcome you here to this very long delayed symposium on poetry, place, displacement. The title that reminds us that many of the lines are needed in the title of mass displacements from uh, in Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan. We should begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the custodians of the land we are on today. This symposium planned for three years, had to be called off two years ago uh, when the pandemic shut everything down. Gratification, some say, is sweetest when on delay. And so it's maybe all the more exciting for us to have this long wait to welcome you to the ground some of the world's most renowned and respected practitioners of and thinkers about poetry. They'll lead us with presentations and conversations about how poetry represent place and displacement, how they differ from other ways of mapping place, and how they attest to histories of human and environmental dislocation. Having learned enormously from the work of the scholars on our two panels, all of which looks like I've been honored to be involved in reporting on one way or another, and having closely reread the inspired students here today, um, each of our speakers were some pleasant here, read from Club McKay's, and just reminding you about um, on sonnets uh, and the Jamaican provision grounds. Harris Feinsaw on the worldwide uses of the concept of the world of poetry. Rachel Galvin, contemporary poets recycling predecessors, seen in light of Latin American cannibalist theory. And Vidyan Ravikiran on South Asian poetry, questions of race and aesthetics. Having read all of these with my students, I feel confident saying there are speakers and the creators of some of those pathbreaking and deeply thought recent scholarship in poetry and three questions that we're grappling with today. So too, so too, as no doubt the students here uh, today read test, um, as well as the contemporary centers, contemporary poetry reading from Kai Miller, our keynote poet, is the author of some of the most profound and memorable poems of the strip of mapping, contested histories of place, and linguistic measures of distance and displacement. We commend him to you uh, his and other speakers' biography in your programs, which if you don't have one, there in the back. But I want to get out, of the, uh, get out of the way so we can get the show on the road quickly, since I hear the next experiment, I will hit in the next few hours. April Fools! I have to put one in there. I'm sorry. Uh, we're grateful for the generous contributions by our co-sponsors, the Institute for Humanities and Local Cultures, beautifully directed by my colleague Johnny Dunkley, and the Creative Writing Program, definitely led by Kiki Petrosini. We're grateful also to John Castine, uh, Brown College for the use of this wonderful tent, uh, capable of withstanding powerful lateness today, both from without and from within. For moderating our, moderating our first panel, uh, we're grateful to Daniel Rusutsi, a prize-winning poet who teaches in English and Latin American and Latino studies departments at the University of Illinois in Chicago and whose most recent book is written at the Massacre in the year 2018. Another collection is the performance of the Human the Book Award in 2016, the Lake Initiative was a finalist for the Britain National Poetry Prize in 2019. It's also a prize-winning translator and the 2017 National Translation Award for the rendition of the Chilean poet, Valerio now, as I turn things over to him to moderate, let's let warm welcome to Daniel, who's going to be in our first two 
panelists, Sonia Osman here and Paris Barnes. Charlie Cobb, 
the Howard University student and Stickfield organizer who proposed the school's aim, quote, to fill an intellectual and creative vacuum in the lives of young Negro Mississippians and to get them to articulate their own desires, demands, and questions. At the core of the project were citizenship, curriculum, and black history. Our reading and writing poetry were paired in these hands. The teachers saw poetic education as integral to the political education rather than apart from it. In the 1965 essay of Florence Howe, a white uh, freedom school teacher and professor at Gallagher College, who would go on to be the founding editor of Feminist Press and sort of shape a whole other poetic tradition out of this moment, reflected on the dual outcome that all over Mississippi this summer, students were becoming both social activists and poets. These anti-hierarchical, socially motivated spaces for studying poetry were constitutive of the developing disciplinary methods of American literature and of the day-to-day -day life. So, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but um, the student poems uh, to which I was referring uh, were published in uh, in three newspapers that were circulating broadly among people in the movement, and they were also collected in this volume um, that came out in 1965 with a forward note from Langston Hughes. Um, and his note um, offers a sort of theory of poetry's social function. He says, and I'm sorry that you can't see the text, but he says, Poetry possesses the power of variation. And also, some poems, like many of the great verses of the Bible, man kind. Uh, you'll also maybe be able to see that on the left of the foreword is the dedication to the memory of Emmett Till. Um, and um, I want to draw attention to this um, because I think it also invites us to situate these poems, which are written by teenagers and are not at all famous or anthologized or, or circulating anymore um, in the more well-known archive of memorial verse that was written in response to Till's murder. Um, it also allows us to see the connection between um, freedom school poetry and broader discussions about education, integration, and youth. Um, Till was murdered in 1955 and the dedication says, now five years later we're here in Mississippi and this is what's happening. This new kind of education, this new understanding of possibility for young people. Um, and finally, it, it sets us up to think about poetry and the poems of this volume in relationship to state and vigilante regimes, regimes of discipline and punishment. And I'll return to that point um, in a minute. Um, the most well-known uh, poem in the, in the volume at the time was this poem, Again, I'm sorry, you can't see, called The House of Liberty um, by Joyce Brown. And this is um, Joyce Brown on the, on the left at a, at a freedom school convention. Um, she was 16 years old um, when she wrote the poem and a student in the freedom school and later a teacher in Macomb, Mississippi. Um, and she went on to be a SNCC organizer. She wrote the poem after the private house in which classes were supposed to be held in Macomb was bombed by white supremacists. Um, and the school had to begin outdoors for lack of another education. Um, so this poem is really an address to community elders, black real business, and church leaders to whom she was appealing for an alternative space or funding for an alternative space. She dramatically read the poem aloud on the grass in front of the bombed out school, um, a story which circulated widely in the press and ultimately did help SNCC raise the funds for a new um, space. So one of the things I think is interesting about this is that it's, it's what Hortense Spillers would call like an intramural appeal. It's a, it's a communication within the black community. Um, and it's also, I think, very powerfully an intergenerational appeal and almost like accusation of her elders and holding accountable of them. Um, I'll read for you the second stanza. She writes, I asked for your churches and you turned me down, but I'll do my work if I have to do it on the ground. You will not speak for fear of being heard, so crawl in your shell and say, do not disturb. You think because you've turned me away, you've protected yourself for another day. 
the image of these young poets who work are taking place on the ground emphasizes the connection between the schools, the movement for voting rights, and the movement for agricultural sovereignty um, that were all taking place in this moment. And it draws our attention to the mediating role of lyrics through and among these intimately linked spaces in Mississippi, specifically in the U.S. South and more broadly. So as some of you know, I've written elsewhere about the ground, and specifically the provision ground, as a figure for black self-determination over and against the economy of implementation, drawing on Sylvia Winter's foundational work in that area. In the case of Brown's poem, On the Ground, it carries the meaning of the political idiom, connoting close to the people, close to reality, or even in military terms, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat rather than aerial warfare. One of the things that happens in the rest of the poem is that um, the image that takes over is one of teaching inside the bombed out building. Um, and also the adults' fear of the bomb is that which prevents them from taking social action. Uh, the ground is also literal here. In this stanza and in the moment of its public recitation, Brown and her fellow students and teachers are doing their work on the ground, outdoors, rather than in the safety and security of a school building or even a makeshift school building. But here, this provisional space is also a provisioning one. Brown's dramatic reading of the poem on the ground is an occasion for fundraising. So in a small way, her work on the ground allows her to transform the economic conditions of black study and provision a path toward freedom. Now, fundraising for building is maybe the ultimate institutional practice. Uh, SNCC organizers often talked about the need for, quote, our own institutions to replace Mississippi schools and break power structures. Um, and one of the things that they were responding to in particular was the very limited seasonal schedule of Mississippi education for black students um, who were mostly um, laborers um, during that season. Um, but establishing a literary institution was by no means, as I've said, the intention of the project in the schools. This was not, in that sense, a disciplinary space, not even an interdisciplinary space. In fact, you might say that as part of the broader Freedom Summer project, the schools participated in a counter-disciplinary movement. The mass meetings that SNCC and CORE held in the evenings in the same communities as some of the schools and the students who attend these meetings Classes during the day often involve detailed accounts of protesters' work, work and workers being jailed, being killed, and otherwise disciplined by the state and white citizens, as well as instructions on how to avoid arrest, how to meaningfully risk arrest, and what to do if arrested. There are a lot of like pamphlets in the archive of what to do if you get arrested in Mississippi. So, insofar as poetry was there in these spaces, I want to suggest that this poesis is something like the method making Catherine McKittrick talks about in Dear Science. Dear Science, sorry, where method is a practice of freedom that destabilizes discipline itself. I think we can see this counterdisciplinary method in the dedication of the volume to Till's memory. Here it is a little bit closer up. Um, describe the sort of vigilante disciplining of Tell um, and these expressions as a counter to that in the poems. Um, and as we'll see in a few minutes, we can also hear the proximity among pedagogy, poesis, and this kind of anti-disciplinary, anti-carceral work in the recordings of freedom songs at the SNCC mass organizing meetings where many of the same students gathered in the evening. But before listening to one such recording, I want to reflect briefly um, in, in order to engage more directly the theme of this gathering on the places of the freedom songs and their lyrics. One of the voices most closely associated with the freedom songs of the 1960s was that of organizer Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, this is from an article from uh, the movement, uh, one of the newsletters of seen. Hamer was a timekeeper and a sharecropper on a plantation in Louisville, Mississippi, before she attempted to vote in Indianola in 1962. 
um, was turned away uh, from registration along with others on the basis of a fabricated literacy requirement and then was forced through the plantation owner's threats of retaliation to leave her workplace and along with it her home. She became a powerful advocate for black voting rights and later went on to found the Farm Workers Freedom Cooperative in 1969. Um, so she saw agricultural sovereignty as one solution um, to um, poverty in her community, which she had gone back to live. Um, she established a pig bank um, and community land ownership as models for economic alternatives to sharecropping. Her life and work then linked to struggles for voting rights and educational justice to labor sovereignty and food security um, in ways that I think are so resonant still today. Charlie Cobb remembers how Hamer rose to prominence in the union during the fateful bus ride home from attempted to vote in Indianola. And that narrative um, would also later form the core of Hamer's very famous testimony at the DNC convention in 1964, which was so harrowing and so powerful that Lyndon Johnson um, actually right, talk, like, spontaneously planned a press conference in order to push her off the air so it wouldn't be broadcast live. Um, Cobb writes, we had brought 17 or 18 people down from Louisville to try to register to vote in the courthouse. M.C. Moore had rented this bus that's used to carry day workers to the cotton fields. Afterwards, everybody gets back on the bus. Well, now it's getting late, and the driver starts to head back to Louisville, and he gets stopped by the deputy sheriff, who arrests the driver for driving a bus of the wrong color. Um, Hamer, in her testimony, makes a lot of puns and jokes about that. Um, and that's when Mrs. Hamer emerged, because she starts to sing. She's singing these freedom songs. This little light of mine, ain't nobody thinking to let nobody turn me around. We hadn't really noticed Mrs. Hamer before, and really, I always thought her singing kind of shored up everybody, even us, in you know, this next staff. I mean, because you know, you really don't want to be stuck on the road in Sunflower County, Mississippi, at sunset, and identified with civil rights. It was pretty scary. So not unlike Joyce Brown's poem, Mrs. Hamer's lyrics, her practice and performance of them had a very practical purpose, the shoring up of her comrades in the face of imminent violence and arrest. As Hamer told um, a field worker in Louisville, singing is one of the main things that can keep us going. When you're in a brick cell, locked up, and haven't done anything to anybody, but still you're locked up there, and sometimes words just begin to come to you, and you begin to sing. Like one of my favorite songs, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Going to Let It Shine. This same song goes back to the fifth chapter of Matthew, which is the Beatitudes of the Bible, when he says, a city that sets on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light shine so that men would see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. I think singing is very important. It brings out the soul. So there are two things I want to highlight in Hamer's lyric theory. First is the emphasis on singing as a functional tool in movement work, which I've already spoken about. And the second is her conflicted description of the process through which the lyrics emerge. On the one hand, she says, sometimes words just begin to come to you, sort of like as if spontaneously, it's origins other than immediate inspiration, in this case, the Bible. Um, how does a song travel from the Beatitudes to the brick cell to the Atlantic City boardwalk where Hamer sang outside of the DNC convention? Um, I think it's important that this particular song um, uh, was first recorded in a prison cell um, um, by the Lomaxes and also um, written about earlier than that by others. For Hamer and other civil rights workers, civic and lyric education both played a role in the study and development of the song lyrics. We know that Hamer learned some of the songs that became movement songs, such as I'm Gonna Land on the Shore working on a plantation alongside her mother. And this, too, is where she learned a theory of singing as one of the things that can keep us going, whether it feels in the jail cell, in the church, or on the bus. 
certainly, learning the songs was not a matter of memorization and faithful replication, but rather innovation and improvisation as the music traveled geographically and intergenerationally. So, for instance, the verses of This Little Light of Mine would change from all of Woolville, if he was to sing it in her hometown, to tell Jim Clark, um, referring to the town's violent sheriff, um, it, when people were singing it in Selma, Alabama. Um, and then again to all over Charlottesville when it was sung right here in 2017, when Reverend Sagu and other clergy used the song to drown out the chants of the United Right Rally. Hema herself instructed others in the lyrics. Um, so I think this is important too. She's often talked about as an organic intellectual because she had um, sort of limited formal schooling, but I would argue that she's, I'm sorry, the picture's a little funny, but she, she was really invested in pedagogy and teaching. Um, uh, she had been an avid reader since childhood in spite of having such limited access to formal schooling. Um, uh, because of her, because she was a worker. Um, uh, and studying and teaching the music was bound up in her commitment to teaching adult literacy classes, which was an important component of the voting rights campaign, the Freedom Schools, and later the Farm Workers Cooperative. Um, so this is um, Hamer visiting the um, Highlander Folk School um, on the right, and lessons at the Highlander Folk School on the left. Um, and, and that school started teaching lyrics as part of organizing workers as early as the 1950s. Um, so I'd like us to end um, by um, taking us into another site of learning, similar to those in which Hamer participated. Um, uh, and I want to note here again um, that these SNCC organizing meetings, which is what we're about to hear, were connected deeply to the school's project, right? So the same kids were at the organizing meetings often and at school, and uh, folks who would be invited to come and speak or sing at the organizing meetings would go into the school and teach the kids poetry and music during the day, right? So there was a lot of fluidity between these two spaces. So the particular recording I'm going to play is not actually Hamer, uh, but the organizer James Foreman, um, and this was recorded by Moses Moon in Selma, Alabama in 1963. Um, and it captures Foreman directing the singing of a song called We'll Never Turn Back. Um, when we come into the recording, we've already heard the song straight through once, but Foreman's not really happy with how it's gone, and he's decided it needs to be sung again with some construction. Um, so here he's explaining the significance of the um, lyrics, which is a memorial for the murdered civil rights worker, Herbert Lee. And he's also theorizing the purpose of singing in a way that I think we can think of as related to Hamer's um, theory of song and to Hughes's theory of poetry um, in the student club. Um, so we'll listen a little, talk a little, and listen a little. Because this man was killed in a voter registration drive in the Mid County, Mississippi. 52 years old, and he's trying to register voters. He had a wife and 11 kids, and they threatened to kill him. And they still persisted in trying to get Negroes registered to vote. And the state representative came up, shot him, old blood. And he was left lying there for about two hours before anybody came to attend to him. And the man that shot him, of course, was completely uh, uh, exonerated and went scot free. And in Mississippi, the song is very important, and it's also important in other places in the movement. So I think that perhaps we ought to try to learn the song and sing it again. And I just want to uh, rearrange some of the verses that one got in front of the other. So why don't we just say, you know, just say some of the words. We've been duped and we've been sworn. Everybody.
if you make the echo here to sing these songs, then you won't have any fear, or your fear will be minimized Monday. So now let's everybody open their mouths to say these words. studying their meaning. Um, so it's a kind of movement that works against the refusal of turning back um, in the lyrics. Um, and we're just going to listen to one more clip. Um. Back for you. Thank you. 